Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like KimuraWare from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 168 of the Jeff Nolzine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on an old friend, Jess Leodon, pro MMA fighter, actor, stuntman, such an incredible career, such an incredible person. Tons of value, tons of fun on this interview. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. We are live. We are live on the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. i got to swallow across across from the the screen here. Uh, Special guest today, Jess Leodon. What is up, brother? Uh, Well, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's it's good to finally talk to you after all those years of knowing each other. It's one of those things that with social media, a lot of people know each other. They live in different countries. They kind of know each other, but they never met each other. So there you go. After all those years, we finally, we finally get to meet. For, for, for the audience to know, um, we're going to get into, obviously, Jess's history here as a, as a pro athlete. But I, my company, Kamor, were actually reached out to Jess, God, probably 10, 12 years ago. And uh, we did some sponsorship. We did a T-shirt. We're going to talk about his nickname, The Joker. Tons of stuff here. Um, I want to start off by... With with your martial art background and getting into professional fighting, when did you? When was your first introduction to martial arts? What age and and how did it aspire to turn into a professional career? Let's talk about that to get that side of the know about you. I started martial art when I was eight. So I don't know about Canada, but in France back in the days, um, you kids you put them into judo or football. Yeah, and I was terrible at soccer, so <laughs> I went into judo i was not much better to be honest but that's how i started martial art yeah. the reason i wasn't very good is my father was very violent with me, so i was a very introvert kid i didn't know how to fight back so i like to go to the judo and learn a technique but when it was time to do randomly and sparring and stuff like that i would let people throw me around because i didn't know how to fight back because of what i was living at home it was pretty bad. I mean, I remember going to school with like two black eyes and so on and so forth. So it was pretty tough. And then after judo, I did karate around 10 years old for a little bit. And then really, I really started training really properly when I was 14 years old with Thai boxing. And at that time, I moved away from my father. Me and my mother moved away. We were homeless for a little while. We, we lived in a special care center. And then after we got an apartment, and that's when I started Thai boxing. And then then... I was a reborn. I wanted to fight everybody. It's like I flipped the switch completely. And Thai boxing was perfect for me. That was 1984, something like that. And Thai boxing back then, it was a bit like MMA about 15 years ago. You know, it was still yeah. new. People didn't know what it was. And I was living in a tough neighborhood. Um, and uh, that's how I started training and competing afterwards. Do you think that that... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into something you said there. I mean, obviously, when you and your mom moved away, was that, okay, obviously, that was a release to yourself at that point. But was that a trigger point to getting into, like, really getting into the aggression and all that from your dad? Like, what turned there? What was that trigger point there? I think at that age, I think one of the reasons is my mother wanted to move. Because obviously, it was beating up my mother as well. But um, I think at that point, my mother realized that we were going to start to fight back. So it's not only after we left that I became like that, is I'm starting to become like that. You know, I was fighting school a lot, uh, and I was just start growing into a man, a young man, because I was 14 years old. Yeah. But when you come from that background, you tend to grow up much quicker. Yeah. Uh, and my mother saw it. And I remember one time I fought back. You know, my, my father used to abuse me. And this one time he put me on the ground and he put both of his knees on my arm and he was slapping me around. And I bite his inside thighs, which kind of make him fall back. And then, in fact, by that time, he wanted to kill me. I remember him getting a knife. My mother was in front of him. And by then, she knew that it was time for her to go because one of us is going to end up in a very bad spot. So it was a combination of two, of two. And then I had all this aggression. I've been burning up all those years inside me. 
And thank God I find martial arts, and specific, specifically Thai boxing, which suited me perfectly. And I put all my heart and soul into it. And, um, you know, the rest is history. History. I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question and we'll drop this topic. But do you, have you kept a relationship with your father after that? or No. I've never Maybe. heard of him again. I've never was interested. Yeah. Um, and I never really thought about it. I know it's part of my part. I, I'm not making a big deal about it. You know, yeah. I never find myself being, um, I don't know, um, I, I don't know how to explain it. But basically, it's also part of my, I'm a very introvert person. I don't speak to people very much. I don't like to go out. Uh, uh, even now, I have no problem with my mother and my sister. I've got like four sisters and I love them dearly, but I don't really keep in touch with them. I kind of learned from a young age to keep myself to myself. I was very independent. I was living in my own little world. Um, I, and as much as I love my mother, I would probably talk to her maybe four times a year. Um, I barely ever talk to my sister, even so I love them. It's because I think I just created a shell around me which kind of helped me because when I was moving in country like in the States or in Japan where I didn't speak the language and I had to find jobs and stuff like that, I didn't rely on anybody else but myself. So on the same time, it was a strength. But on the time, I also feel very lonely. You know, I don't make friends very easily. I can't really say I've got a very, very close friend. And even so, sometimes I, I start building a relationship with people. I don't really get in touch. I don't really know how to handle it. You know, I don't really know how to, uh, is this too much? Is it not enough? You know, it's, it's very weird. So, uh, but besides that, I think I'm a pretty balanced person. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing here, then we'll kind of pass on to continue the martial art. It's, it's, it's the whole mindset where I talk about this a lot. And, I, and, and one thing about me, I know you probably don't know, is I actually coach a lot of dads and stuff like that too. And it's the living with no regrets. And I think a lot of, times um time passes we're so secluded in our own careers and our own lives and all of a sudden something happens to a loved one and i and i went nine months ago my dad passed away and i would add a very very close relationship with him but you still even though i saw him on a regular basis i talked to my dad on a regular basis i still had regrets i wish i had did more things with him so it's like sometimes it's okay to to go out of that way and 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 and, and reach out to your mom and to your sister and stuff because there is going to be a time when our we're just a, we're just a path on a journey. Our lives, they, it, anything can happen in seconds. And with something happening, and then you have those regrets, like I should have reached out more, should stuff. So just just keep that in mind that it's okay to reach out more, even though you feel like you you're okay on your own. But it's still it's precious because there's nothing like that bond of family too, right? So even though reaching out and stuff like that, sometimes. It's not that I don't care, but also oh, I know you love them. You said that you've said that more yeah. than once. I don't mean it in a negative way, but I'm saying in a way like. It's, 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 it's sometimes we live with, we, we do stuff and, and, and that we have regrets later on in life. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think, I, I guess I've got to force myself in a way. I'm, I know it doesn't sound good to say it that way, but also I'm so driven by my career, by work, by achieving something because I yeah. come from nothing. You know, yeah. 14 years old, when all of this happened, I stopped school. I've got no qualification. Yeah. So I, I start, you know, I'm so driven into having success. Um, and also, when I talk to my mother, we've got nothing really to say to each other. She doesn't understand my work. Uh, yeah. I don't understand her. You know how it is when you talk yeah, to her. Yeah. Without talking about the neighbor and, and the yeah. dog is shitting alone, and you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I still call her, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm pretending. And then, oh, you know what, fool with your sister and this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, really, you know, I, I don't really know what to say. So, but I guess if she wasn't so far away, because I live in a different country. Perhaps I would go and see her more often. I would make a lot more effort and stuff like that. But yeah. Also, I suppose also I'm, I'm very driven by having success because nobody ever done anything for me. So I feel like if I let go, I don't want to go back to the bottom and start everything from zero again. So I'm, I'm very. What, what's your What's your vision of success? What What Where What level do you need to get to? Because I look at you and I see success because you're in an industry that millions and millions of people try to get into and have a career with and struggle. And you're, you're making a decent living off it. You're doing well. You got to the top level and, and did extremely well. Like I was just watching yesterday, some of your fights extremely well at the UFC level. Like you, you got to the top level as a pro athlete. You're getting, you're getting obviously a lot of work as an actor and as a stuntman. We'll talk about that. 
where is to you success? Where do you vision success? I'm never going to achieve success. I'm very aware of that. Yeah. When I stopped my fighting career, I realized, you know what? None of this made me happy because it was never enough. As soon as you finish your fight, you know, you go in the locker room, you're excited, you know, you talk about this, but straight away in the press conference, so who are you fighting next? And then the next day, people are already thinking, and hey, we're moving on. All of this, all of those efforts, getting beat up in the gym, running up and down the hill at 6 o'clock in the morning, shitting yourself for the whole week, being nervous, cutting the weights, you're fighting, you're getting beat up, you win, you got this explosion inside you, and then within an hour, it's gone. We're moving on. So I, I knew, I know that even so tomorrow, I might even have a very big movie, work with Michael Bay, with Michael Mann, win an Oscar, I still won't be satisfied. What makes me happy is the drive, is to keep moving forward, is to feel like I'm doing something with my life. My first ever job, I was 11 or 12 years old. Yeah. Uh, I went to different store, tried to find a job. Nobody wanted me. And I went to a farm, a goat farm. And I said, oh, can I get a job? Because I remember my mom used to buy cheese over there. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I don't want to get paid. I don't want no money. I just want a job. So they felt sorry for me. And they gave me a job. And on a Wednesday, on a weekend, I would go there. And I would feed the goat, clean up the poo. I would learn how to um, get the milk out of them. And I didn't want any money. You know why? All I wanted to do is to feel like I was doing something in my life, like I was worth something. And I think this never went away. And today when I'm driven and acting and always doing better and walking and stuff like that, it's the whole sensation of walking and doing something and driving forward. That's what makes me happy. I know I never, even if I reach my goal, I know that's never going to make me happy. Money doesn't interest me. I mean, it helps. Um, fame and all those, it doesn't interest me. Is that drive. It's always try to do better and pushing myself and manage to achieve something and then keep going forward. That's what makes me happy. Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts it's crazy you're saying that because that's i mean i've been an entrepreneur for 26 years i started being self-employed when i was 19 and a true entrepreneur everything you describe as an entrepreneur they're they're never satisfied there's always that next venture that next opportunity the next things even when they succeed financially or anything it's always what's next and i always say the top you put the top entrepreneurs in the world and you put the top athletes in the world they have the same drive so it's very it's everything you're saying is dead on and 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 i i guarantee a lot of people could relate to that right which is so important so when did martial arts become Actually, when, when did you step in the cage or into the ring the first time? What age were you? Uh, I started Thai boxing at 14. I had my first fight as an amateur at 16. And then he, very quickly, I did the French championship. So it, it might not seem much like for North American doing yeah. French championship in Thai boxing. But back in the 80s, Thai boxing was huge in Europe, especially yeah. in France yeah. and in Holland. Yeah. You know, beside Thailand, that was perhaps the two other countries when people were the elite. Yeah. Thai boxing. Now, America only discovered Thai boxing when MMA came along. Before, yeah. when they said they were doing Thai boxing, they were doing a, a version of kickboxing with knees and elbow, but it was not true Thai boxing. Yeah. So Thai boxing is very, very new in North America. Yeah. So back then in Europe, it was very tough. And so even doing the French championship was like very, very tough. You know, I mean, I know in America, you win a, a random championship and you were champion. And back home, it was not like that, especially not in the 80s. Yeah. So I started with Thai boxing and then I always liked to cross train. I was fascinated by martial arts. I would go to the library and read many books about it. Anything that was on TV, I would watch it. Every time they had a, a TV show when I knew they would have 
something to do with a Japanese or the Chinese mafia I would record it because I knew some guy was going to come and do some kick that perhaps I could replicate. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I was really, you know, driven by it. And I wanted to try different things. And when I would go to Thai boxing and do like some spinning kicks and things like that, my Muay Thai instructor would say, listen, this is not Thai boxing. You can't do that here. And I felt very frustrated. And there was a guy not far from where I was from, um, where was he from? It was from, I won't say Nigeria, but I don't think he's Nigeria anyway. And he was doing full contact karate, but with boxing. So he was basically doing Japanese kickboxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I saw what he was doing, I was like, oh, okay, that's what I want to do. And he was a big black dude. He looked like Billy Blanks back in the days. Uh, he would do the class and talk in English, like one, two, and, you know, he was from Zaire. That's where he was from, yeah. from Zaire. And I really enjoyed him. And I think most of my style pretty much come from here. And then from there on, I start competing in different styles, like kickboxing, with low kick, without low kick. And by the age of 19, I had my first fight in America. That was the 21st of November, 1993. And that's when I saw uh, the first UFC that just happened a couple of weeks before. Because yeah. someone reported it on a VHS. And yeah. when I won the tournament, and because I was doing all those jump kicks and I was French, and I was in Houston, Texas, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And, uh, and people would start talking to me and they say, oh, have you heard of UFC? I was like, what's that? And someone showed me the tape. And that's the first time ever I saw MMA. And that was UFC 1? UFC 1. I remember watching UFC 1 with my dad back back in the day and for uh for our listeners that don't know what vhs is it used to be a tape that we put in to record <laughs> it's so long uh when did when did you evolve your ground game because obviously your first ufc one was uh with a, a submission to is this a sevier the the german i think you beat to he's your first ufc win arm bar is that correct uh who uh, oh me yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I, I won. Uh, I won by armbar on my first UFC. Yeah. UFC. So when when did the ground game evolve? And was it the UFC that the whole Gracie thing that you're one of those guys that turned and fell in love with? No, it didn't. Okay. So how did the ground game well, start? When I saw the first UFC, I didn't know what to make of it. I'm like, is this real? Is this not real? I mean, how can you beat somebody by grabbing onto him on the ground? And that's America. I mean, those guys, they're Hollywood. Is this thing <laughs> really real? And then I kept in touch with a guy in America, which basically wanted me to come back in Houston and open a martial arts school with him. Okay. So he would send me Black Mail Magazine and I would look at the end of it, they would have technique and I would try to train with my friend and kind of try to mess around with it. Yeah. And then in 1995, I moved to the US, to Houston, Texas. I didn't have a green card. I was one of those. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would get a lot of different jobs. Every day was something different. I would load the lawn. I would be a dishwasher. I would put cable for satellite. I would do everything and nothing. And this guy said, listen, we're going to open a martial arts school together. So I was like, okay, I would do that in the meantime. And then back in those days, what people might not remember is we didn't have as many MMA events. A oh, lot no. of MMA yeah. events were on the ground. Yeah. I think like who can shoot started like that? Yeah, um, yeah, stupid bro started like that, yeah. and basically, it was people hey, we close the dojo, yeah. we get a bunch of guys, and we fight. Yeah, and I did my first, and, and there was a lot, and there was a lot of that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did my first tournament like that in 1995 in America, and I did a full main tournament. I fought two guys, I beat up a karate guy in my first round, and the second round, I had a sambo guy, but I don't think he was very good at sambo, and I kind of because I'm a bit gifted and I kind of learned quick, when I was on the ground, I kind of closed guard, I kind of tied him up. And we fought for roughly about 40 minutes, and it was called a draw. Yeah. And that was my introduction to grand game. But yeah. I didn't really train grappling then. Then in 96, because that guy wasn't going to open no karate school, he was going through a divorce, he had a lot of problems. So I went back to the UK. And back then in the late 80s, I would say maybe 97 uh, I met a guy called Paul, two guys called Paul and Alexi. And they started the little club called London Shoot Fighter. And it was a bunch of guys that would do different grand games. Some of them were Sambo. You had some Polish wrestler. You had Jem Zikik, who already fought in Super Brawl and trained with Frank yeah. Shamrock. And I started training with those guys. And that's how I started getting my grand game going. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I was I was just checking something out on you, and it said that uh, I guess it was your first fight. You you put a note saying that uh, you had applied for the UFC 13 years prior. 
That's crazy when you think about that. So you sent an app. I had it work. You actually sent a, like an application in? Yeah, yeah, it was about, I think, 13 or 14 years earlier. Basically, Black Bell Magazine was still advertising if you want to fight in the UFC, fill yeah. up this form. Yeah. So I did fill up that form and I just sent it, you know. Obviously, I was aware that I wasn't going to get picked. I wasn't a big guy back then. I was, you know, a, a, a natural 170. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have, you know, like all those guys, they were all war champion. You know, I wasn't one of those. Yeah. So I didn't get picked up, but I did send an application to the UFC back yeah. then. And then 14 years later, I get hand up in the UFC. After the UFC, you're in the UFC for how many fights? Uh, five. Five fights. After the UFC, you still try to continue your career for how long after that? Uh, I can't remember how many. I think maybe it might be four years or four years or something like that. I know I went six and zero after that, and I fought some tough guy right after the UFC. There was another guy in line to sign for the UFC, you know? and this guy was very tough, and nobody wanted to fight him in the UK. In fact, at that point, the fight priority he beat up a guy, Mad Dog. That ended up signing for the UFC. So this guy was very tough. So how was his ticket to get to the UFC? Yeah. I was like, sure, why not tough, you know, for, you know, um, the, 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 the toughest guy. And not only I fought him, but I won fairly easily and by knockout in the first round. So yeah. I thought, okay, maybe the UFC might think, hey, let's bring him back. They weren't interested. So I kept beating up big guy, beating up guy, beating up guys. But eventually I realized, they don't want me back. You know, I'm too old. Um, and now I'm getting into my late thirties. Yeah. They don't know what to do with me. So when I realized there's no way for me to get back into UFC, I was like, what's the point of this? I'm fighting for a thousand bucks here and there. All those guys, I'm a great opportunity for them because they can move on to the UFC. Me is just another win. What's the point of that? Yeah. 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 Let's, t- let's talk about that. Cause for for people who are just observers and 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 fans watching from home that don't realize, even I, I wouldn't even get even to the UFC level. I'm sure it's, it's it's changed now a bit, but still getting into the UFC. If you're on the undercard and stuff like that, or you're in the if you're not in the top fifteen, you're you're not making real money. It's a hard career, and just like you said, if you're fighting these local shows. You're getting a thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks. Like you're training as a pro athlete for three months, two months to get ready for a fight. You have trainers, you have nutrition, you have supplements, you have most of these guys are struggling. They're not even making enough to survive as an athlete. How hard is that? And 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 do you think do you see in the near future anything changing that direction? Or is just gonna is this something that's gonna continue in this field, in this and in, in this sport, I should say? Well, let's put things back in perspective. When I started fighting professionally in the UK, I was getting paid 50 pounds a fight. 50 pounds. Then it which, went is, to- which is 50 pounds is what equivalent to a Canadian. I mean, we're from Canada here. I say 100, 120 bucks tops. I don't know. I'm not even sure if it's that, but 50 yeah. quid. Yeah. So, and then after he went to 200, 250, it wasn't that much. You know, yeah. It was only when I started fighting in cage rage, I was making maybe... 800 it's not that much um yeah. and my first fight in the ufc was three and three yeah. so three grand to fight and you got another three grand if you win yeah. now how can you prepare for that you know my second one was six and six it was the same this time i decided to go and train in america so we train in team quest so if you remove the flight um you know the room that you need to pay and the food and the renting the car and so on and so forth you know you're barely making any money now that was 15 years ago. Obviously, those guys now get paid a lot more. Also, a thing you have to get in mind is back in the days when you were a pro fighter, you had a very little chance to fight in the UFC. It was a bit of a gamble. It doesn't matter if you went 10 and 0 or not. You yeah. know, it was they didn't have that many events. It was very tough. If you lose, would lose one fight, you were done. Yeah. And now it's a different board game. Now you I can see guys they started MMA three years ago, and now the UFC are the contender. Yeah. Siri Gunn, he came into the UFC with a three fights. Three yeah. fights. Obviously, he's an heavyweight. It's different. You know? yeah. But you got guys now coming to the UFC, and a lot of them, and they started three, four years earlier with a guarantee pretty much, you know what, if you win, if you're a tough guy, if you're entertaining, you're going to sign the UFC. We didn't have that back in the days. And also now, people understand the politics of it. They know, okay, I'll sign with the UFC, now I've got two options. 
I can win a few fights, lose a few, and be a, a local tough guy and say, I'll fight in the UFC. Or am I taking this seriously? And now, take care of my image, promote myself properly, yeah. make sure I'm entertaining before, during, and after the fight. Am mm-hmm. I like, taking this our real business? And if you do that, you can make money. You might not make Conor McGregor money, but you can mm-hmm. make enough money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could and you could use your name to propel your career past that. I mean, I had on, uh, he's still a young, quite a young man, Chad, you know, Chad Mendes. Yeah. I had him, I had him on the podcast and, um, man, such an incredible young entrepreneur. I mean, he's running like four companies since he's left the UFC and he used his name to build these networks, to build these little companies. And now he's out of the UFC and he's got hunting companies. He's got both, like he says, all these brands, he's got, he makes spices, he does all this stuff. And it's and he's doing he's doing extremely well now and is using that name that platform to propel himself. So if you do that with social media, yeah, you could you could do well now, especially with the social media. If you learn how to build yourself as a brand, yeah. Also, Chad is 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 very marketable. He's a good looking guy. He's got this amazing physique. Yeah. He, he he arrived right after me when the UFC start coming up, so you had a lot more eyeballs on you. He went on top, top fight against Conor McGregor, which attracted a lot of people. So it's great publicity for you. So you got all those things coming at you. So if you can use that properly, yeah. then you can make good money. The problem with people is they put all the egg in the same basket. They're like, oh, it's fighting and fighting only. And they don't think about what they can do next to that or after that. Yeah. They, either because they're just very driven by just one thing only is to be a champion or they're too lazy or they're too stupid to do anything else. Yeah. There's different things, you know, I mean, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes you can't blame anybody but themselves, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People talk about, I remember every sport is the same. You can take any individual sports and some of them is going to make millions and millions and some of them, they're not going to make so much money. Some yeah. of them is going to get injured in the middle of their career. Look, yeah. most Olympian, they, a lot of them who's got gold medals, they got a dead, a normal job. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I agree. I agree. And if you even, even like I've from, from North America, my son's heavily involved in baseball and, and I, I've became friends with a lot of pro baseball players and a lot of these guys, I mean, the people see them on TV in the major leagues and they're making millions, but before you get to the majors, you're going through minors, which is triple a double a single a, these guys are making a thousand bucks a month riding buses and 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 it's it is probably a one two percent chance to making to the majors, and these guys are doing that for four or five years, making absolutely no money. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's most sports are like that till you get to the top peak level and all that. Uh, in fact, the UFC have moved on so much the past ten to fifteen years, and I'm not gonna say any name, but now you got fighter that understand all of this, the image and what else you can do, and some of those fighter are extremely popular, make a lot of money, and they haven't beat anybody. They beat guys that should be fighting in their undercard. Why? Because they know how to sell themselves. They understand how the old image work. They got a podcast. They got this. They got that. They understand the game. So there is no reason. Now, the problem is if you're a fighter and you're very good and you're very introvert and you don't really know, you don't really want to do those things, it's going to be tougher. You better be good in the cage. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But that's every sport. Oh, of course. Was, I think David Beckham was he really the best football player ever? He was a very good football player. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he made most of his money from a lot of things because he was good looking and because he could sell himself. Yeah, yeah, the branding aspect, which is so important, and that and that goes to anything. I mean, you're an entrepreneur, you're a coach. You, it doesn't matter what you are. If you could propel your image and brand yourself properly, you make so much more money on it because it's just more eyeballs on you. The more eyeballs on you, the more people want to interact more people want to work with you it's just it's just a cycle let's talk about jess as an actor when was your first acting was it a commercial like when when did you when did you first get behind a camera my first acting gig was back in 1996 or 1997 i was a dishwasher in london i was getting paid three pound an hour um and then uh I was in the afternoon training with these Kung Fu people because they were doing demonstration, not yeah. only martial art demonstration, but they would do the lion dance and dragon dance and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and things like that. And I would train with them and I would do event. And sometimes, you know, we would play in theater or, or business event and I would make a few quid here and there. 
Yeah. Now, those guys, because they were acrobats and so on and so forth, they got an audition to work in a movie called The Nutcracker. And it was the first ever movie made for IMAX cinema. Yeah. It was a short film. So I came along with them to the audition and I got a gig. So for about seven weeks, I worked on that film. I played different character, like one of the toy, and then they had some mouse jumping around. So I was doing that as well. And that was my first ever gig. And from the money I made from that, that allowed me to get my qualification so I can become later on a personal trainer and I stopped being a dishwasher. And then after that, I just left it on the side. Uh, I tried to do a few things. Back in the days, we didn't have the internet, but you had a newspaper. I think it was called Stage. And you would look through it and you would have, you know, yeah. ads looking for people. And I would went to a few auditions, never really got anything. To be fair, my English wasn't very good. I remember also they were shooting Mortal Kombat 2. And I remember going to Shepperton Studio, blag my way in there, try to find where these people were to do an audition. And uh, I got kicked back. Um, and then I was after that constant training on my personal training because I went from making 25 pounds a day to 25 pounds an hour. For me, it was a revelation. A guy that come from the street who was very poor for a very long time. And now I've got the opportunity to make money for myself. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm putting everything into that. In fact, I even had an impact on my MMA career because my job was always a priority for me. MMA at the time, I didn't even thought I would find UFC. We were making, as I said, 50 quid. Yeah. But that was just a bit of fun. I would get into the cage just to have fun. But really, yeah. I didn't see that as a career. So I was always prioritizing my job. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So when was the first, like big action film or big film that you got an opportunity. And then I want to talk about what you said earlier before we went on air about uh, being a stunt man and how, how, how the, how, how the industry works. Cause for people that are once again, on the outside, they don't understand it's a very hard industry. So you went from a fighting industry, which is crazily hard to probably even a harder industry to break into and, and to make a career off and you, and you're doing obviously well at it. Take me through that path. Yeah, uh, In fact, uh, I saw recently uh, on a recent study that only two percent of actors actually make a living from it. Yeah, yeah. I want to make a yeah. living. It's barely a living. So that means they do other things on the side. They do theater, voiceover, this and that, and that means they can pay the rent and put guys in their tank of the car. You know, that's only two yeah. percent of them. You know, yeah. out of the two percent, there's a microscopic number of people that make shit lots of money. Yeah. Um, so I think my first, I did a whole bunch of stuff. I started going to drama school and start learning and I started working as an extra. And when I worked as an extra, some people recognized me. I was like, hold on a minute, are you Jess? I was like, yeah. They said, what are you doing here? You're playing a role. I'm like, no, nah, I'm an extra just like you. <laughs> and people didn't really do it. And then some of the stuntmen recognized me. I started I start to train stuntmen and stunt coordinator. Yeah. So that got me a foot in there, but most people never get me a job, by the way. So I just make sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, after that, I got a gig as an uh, action extra. So for people who don't know what it is, it's sometimes you're an extra, so you're just in the background. But sometimes they need extra that fights a little bit behind the stuntman because you need a bigger crowd. And they would get guys who got military background or martial art background. They would train them for a day or two. And with them, them fight in the background. You're never going to be seen on camera, but it doesn't matter. And I did that on Snow White and Enhancement. And people kind of saw me saying, listen, this guy's got something. And then they give me a job as a stuntman on Thor The Dark World. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then after that, someone said to me, listen, what do you want to be? A stuntman or an actor? Because those two things are two different worlds. Yeah. You need to make different contact. But not only that, if a casting director know you're a stuntman, some of them won't even cast you because you're a stuntman. For them, it's like if you take care of costume or if you take care of makeup. You're something else. You're not an actor. Yeah. So I put a stunt on the side and I focus on acting. And I was getting one line here, two line there. And there's a French director called Julien Siri who gave me my first, my first gig. I played the main bad guy in a film called Night Fair. Yeah. Uh, and um, that was released all over the world, you know, in cinema, but also on, on VOD. And uh, I played a big boogeyman of the film. So you had my face on the poster, my name on the poster. That was in all the underground in Paris. So that was my first big break, if you will. Yeah. And because I got a bit of noise right behind it, I got another film with Jean Reno called Antigone. When I play a smaller role, but I've got a cool fight scene in it. So yeah. I was like, okay, that's it. We're on. I got an agent now. Everything's going to go. And I didn't work for two years. It was that much of a gap. Yeah, that, because that's, nobody that's cares. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's many people who do movies. There's many people on a poster. So who are you? Who's your agent? This is the way the movie business works. It's all about politics. Yeah. If you have a small percentage percentage of people that are there to create, to make exciting things. But the majority of people in the movie business, they're there for themselves. This is a business. So yeah. it's like, okay, just you know, who are you? Who's your agent? What can your agent bring to me? Are you with a big agency? Are those agents can perhaps represent me? Or can I make good contact for the for furthering my career? If the answer is no, it's like, get the fuck out of here. So it's that simple. And I still get that today. I just got cast now for a movie and I'm starting in a week. Yeah. And the director contacted me directly. He said, I saw you in uh, one shot. Um, I think you're great. I want you to play the bad guy in my next movie. Read the script. I read the script. Like, okay, I like it. Let's do this. Cool. He went through casting and the casting didn't like it at all. Now they're going through with my agent and you can clearly see they don't like it. Why? Because they're not getting nothing out of it. They could have taken this role and approach a bigger agency making new contact, polishing their contact already made and make it about themselves. Yeah. So the movie business is very much like that. So if you don't bring nothing to nobody, it's going to be very hard to climb up the ladder. So luckily, after a few years of doing physical role, I mean, I, I walked in Hong Kong with Donnie Yen in a field called Big Brother when I'm fighting him. And the guy said, listen, you're doing stunts. You're doing your own stunts. Why don't you just do stunts? And I realized, hold on a minute. Those casting directors that would not cast me because I do stunts, they're not casting me anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm going to start doing stunts. Yeah. So I trained with the stunt guys, and then after that, I started doing stunts. And the first real gig as a stuntman that I did was a Hobbs and Show. Yeah. yeah. And then from then, I haven't stopped. And, 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 and so you're doing, obviously, more stunting than the stunt acting than the actual full acting, or is it balanced? Last year, I did nine projects, nine film and TV show, and uh, I think I did four stunts and five acting. How's the financial difference? Is there a financial difference between them? Uh, depending what type of movie you do. If you do one of those straight-to-video movies as an actor, the pay is terrible. Yeah. The pay is terrible. You're doing it because you want to exist, because you want to be proactive. Yeah. I mean, some of them get paid well money. You know, when you see a veteran actor in a straight-to-video movie is because probably he got paid close to a million dollars a day. He did three to five days shoot when he shoot all this close-up and he create a story around that. And maybe you've got an opportunity to get on this, but then there's no more money. So you might just get four, five hundred bucks a day, which is still a lot of money. Remember, I used to make 25 pounds a day. All right? yeah, yeah. But in the stunts, I mean, you're making between six to 700 pounds uh, for rehearsal and then when you're shooting you go over time yeah. and then when you're shooting so many days so you can make close to a thousand bucks a day as a stunt performer which is still which is not bad which is really um, good money if you're steadily working that's really good money yeah but as an actor i made in between 500 to two grand a day but now here's the difference if i've got an actor i've got let's say a dozen line yeah. we're going to shoot that shit in one day okay so you're going to come we do your day you get your five, six, seven, eight hundred crank, done. But now in a movie, sometimes you might just see me three seconds getting shot in the head. It was like, okay, that must have been easy. No, we did three weeks of rehearsal for that because I went from A to B and the helicopter, we land down. You might not see me, but I'm there. I'm yeah. walking in the corridor, all bunch of stuff that have been cut off the movie, but I did three weeks of rehearsal and I did three weeks of shooting. So even so, you see me in a movie getting shot. Within three seconds, I've done six weeks of works. So because of that, I make a lot more money from stunts. Yeah. So with, I think that's another part of the, the industry as well is, is with the recordings, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of times you would imagine you're going to be seen a lot more in a film. And then when it's actual, the final cut comes out, you're like, Wow, that was, a lot of it was cut. It, it, that's a regular basis, right? I'm assuming. Yeah. Even as an actor, I did. I worked in a very terrible movie called uh, Holmes and Watson. Very with, terrible uh, movie. With, <laughs> <laughs> right? I was so excited to work with them, uh, and I had a role in it. And basically, you barely see me in the movie. I'm still in the credit. The credit yeah. is still there, uh, and I'm still on it on IMDb. But all my stuff got cut off. And, and that happens all the time. Even in Night Fair, when I play one of the main characters, there's all a bunch of... That's, that's the way it happened. Because they make a movie, 
And then after they have to cut it, recut it, the producer come behind and say, oh, actually, how about we change this, we change that. Sometimes you can be one of the main characters and you can barely be seen in the movie, which is even worse, or cut completely, which yes. that's terrible. You know? uh, so, so yeah, you can't really be attached. But to be honest, when I work as an actor, what's the most exciting part for me is not to see myself on screen, it's to do the work, to be there on day and to leave that moment. You know, to have an accent, to change my voice, to act, to react a different way, to hear the people that, oh, that was, that was good. You know, to do that, that, that's that's what the most exciting for me. The rest, being seeing myself and just, you know, playing with myself, looking at myself on the screen, that's not me. I don't care. <laughs> Dude, well, here's the, uh, are you always trying to perfect your, like, you're your, your, trying to perfect your art? Are you, like, still taking courses? Are you chilling out doing voice courses or anything like that are you always trying to perfect yourself or at this I'm level trying. at this point you're you're just doing what you do i'm trying to uh, the thing is depending what kind of course you do i'll find sometimes some of the courses are contradictory with each other but yeah. sometimes you would go in a course and the guy giving the course you realize he's never worked on a movie set because he's telling you the opposite of what you hear on a movie set but sometimes yeah. you got to peek what you do um sometimes i play with my friend uh if I go to do an audition, I still do a lot of self-tape and I study them and I look at them and say, how oh, is that going, this and that. Or sometimes I do an audition and I know I haven't. I'm like, you know what, maybe I should have done it that way. And I do it again myself. You know, I fought all over the world in a multitude of disciplines. Thai boxing, kickboxing, shoot boxing in Japan. I fought MMA, I fought in UFC. I competed in wrestling internationally, even in Iran. And I'm pretty much self-taught. You know, I go out cautioning me things here and there. But one of those guys, and I'm not the only one, there's plenty of people like that. We figure shit out myself. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure you you know a lot of entrepreneurs. You can do seminars as much as you want, but really, very quickly, you understand how that works and you figure yeah. it out, isn't it? Yeah. I remember yeah. when I started watching some of the Pride video, I was like, oh, I see what technique you tried to do. I've never seen it before. I remember when I started grappling, there's a guy called Kamal Luck who helped me a lot. And he put me in a heel hook. I was like, oh, what's that? He said, that's a heel hook. And he took five seconds to show it to me. Two minutes later, I couldn't with the same move. So acting, I approach it the same way. Yes, I did classes, things like that. But I walk a lot on instinct. Yeah. Sometimes I do have coach. Like right now, I'm preparing this role. And um, I'm playing a Ukrainian. So I did the Russian accent before. But I've never done Ukrainian. So I got a coach. And we're walking on my line. And... We think about how the character is going to be and so on and so forth. And so let's, hear, let's hear your Ukrainian accent. No, uh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you change. Uh, you know, like for example, uh, when Russians say H, you know, they say, ah, you know, yeah. they that. Ukrainian, they don't. They do have the H in the language. So they yeah. would say, ah, they would say, you know. So it's a little bit like that. You know, you still got to, you still got to, you still yeah. got all things. But you got to play around with it. You know, yeah. so um, and that's very interesting. Just that is exciting. Yeah, I walk I in a room, back and forth, playing, acting it, preparing it, thinking about my character. And the day I arrive on set, I take all of this, do a board with it, and put it in the trash. And act and react with what my, you know, partner gives to me. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Martial arts. How often are you still training, and and how big a part of it of your life is it still there? Not as much, for the reason being that I'm busy with work. Uh, because I am who I am, wherever I train, uh, sparring are never easy. You know, people always want to take your head off, your arm off. Yeah, it's very yeah, competitive. Yeah, and yeah. I am very competitive. Now yeah. there's two things happening. Let's say tomorrow I go to the gym, I spar with a guy. I didn't do so well because my cardio wasn't very good, my reflex wasn't very good, and I'm not going to like it. So I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to put more time into my conditioning, my training, because I want to beat that guy. But why? I'm not fighting in the UFC anymore. My energy should be on something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. one thing. Two, I don't want to get injured. Yeah, of course. You know, that's that's one thing. And sometimes it's just a scratch. It's just a bump. It's something. You're even doing grappling. You caught a knee there. All of a sudden, you have to go to work next week. And you say, what the fuck is that? Yeah. You know? So all those things. And also, it's a question of time. I just yeah. finished working on Luther here. And I would have to leave home at 5.30 in the morning to beat traffic, to be on, on set at 8. We won't start before 9.30. We would walk until 9.30 p.m. By the time I remove my costume and my makeup is about 10. I get home at 11.30. For 15, time, 15, 16 hour days, huh? 
Yeah, by the time you try to eat something and it's midnight, you go to bed, you got to pick up, you got to get up at five. When have I got time to train? Yeah. Yeah. So my training ran, I realized more on weightlifting, looking the part. Yeah. A lot of pad work, a lot of bad work. Yeah. Um, I do bags, I do running, I do things like that. And when it's a little bit quiet, especially in the summer now, I go and meet some other stunt guys, which some of them do have very good um, martial arts skills. And we do some sparring, we move around, we exchange technique and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could do more, but also, as I said, it's very complicated what you find the time. When I'm not walking, the last thing I want to do is to go to your class in the evening again, finish training at nine. I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, right there. You see, when you, you do that type of hours, when you're off work, I wish I could train in the morning because I'm a morning guy. I go and do the, go to the gym every morning or, or in the afternoon, but I don't want to train in the evening. And That's I've got a gym right across the street from me, literally two minutes, called yeah. the fight zone. And But they mainly do jiu-jitsu. And in the morning and afternoon class, they're just beginners. Yeah. So you try to talk to them. So oh, how about, do you have a pro team? Can I train with them? And they look at you and, like, who the fuck are you? Because I'm old school. It's 15 years ago, it's funny. See. For them, I just a random <laughs> motherfucker. So, so, you know, uh, so right now, uh, I just need to be away. I do bits and pieces. But you don't forget it. Occasionally... I might have a guy in the gym because I walk in a, I train in the gym called Muscle Walk and they do have a ring and everything down there. And sometimes I go, do have a guy say, hey, you want to move around a bit? I'm like, yeah, sure, move around. And I still got it. I'm fine. You know, <laughs> it's within my blood. <laughs> uh, last couple of questions I'm going to ask you before we head out here today. Superpower. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I don't know. It's very hard. A superpower. I think uh, super strength, you know, would be useful for everything and nothing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I like to use a second word, nothing. It's true. It's very true. Super strength would help you. You know, someone just piece you up, you do, boop, hey, it would fly, you know. I mean, it'd be great. It would be so useful, you know. Uh, nobody fuck around with you. They put you to jail. You up, oh, you escape. You yeah. know, great. Um. With the your career right now, acting, is there more opportunity in, like, for example, the U.S. or anything like that, or are you, or, or is it like like traveling wise? So I'm I'm assuming you do most of your opportunity yeah. in the U.K. You stay you stay around the U.K. Is there if if you did want to, and which is hard, obviously you have, you're settled, you have your life, you have your family. Would there be more opportunity, or is at this at this stage you're content with just the opportunities you're getting there? I think it's a very complex one. If you look like someone like en, uh, Henry Cavill or Tom Hardy, they still live in, in, in London. Yeah. I don't think you need to live in LA anymore. By the time now we go Zoom, we can send self yeah. You got comedian and actor in America. They live all over, all over America. They live in yeah. Midway, they live in Florida. Yeah. Uh, so for me, if I would move to LA, there's a million guys like me. Yeah. There's yeah. tons of guys. I would, I would, people wouldn't even notice me. So at least here, there's not as many. And yes. yet, there's a lot of blockbusters shooting here in the UK, but also all over Europe. Uh, you got all the Netflix show. You got a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of work here. I don't need to go to America. There's work here. And at least here, my name's been around enough so people know. Oh yeah, I know Jess. You know, yeah. if I would go to America, there's way too many people. Not only way too many people, but as I said, I'm close to 50 years old. Look the way I look. I'm not what's in fashion right now. Nobody's gonna give me an audition. You know, especially with the accent. Because Americans are like, oh, you got an accent? What? Oh, we don't understand you. You know, they, they're just weird. You know? If you want to break in America, I think ideal is to do a film in Europe that just break through either critically yeah. or financially. And then you got something to go to an agent in America and say, hey, now you can sell me. You know, but just going there with your hands in your pocket, yeah. I'm not going to go nowhere. So how, um, how long have you been with your agent right now? Uh, I think I say four years and I would say that 95% of the job I got has nothing to do with my agent. It's like that. I, I hear a lot about that. It is like that, huh? And it's is right. it, it, it and, and, and how does that work? Is it more beneficial? Like you see, you see, I talk, I talk to a lot of pro athletes. Is it more beneficial to be with a smaller agency that they're going to be more dedicated to you, but don't have the contacts or a bigger agency that you're just a number? Like, how does that, where's that balance? I think it's all down to you and doing your own hustle. Either it's always, I suppose, being better with a big agency, but you know, so people can understand. Agents are like movie stars. 
you go to the massive movie star, the A Easter, and from there it goes down, down, down. But the A Easter, the big movie star, there's only a few of them. It's the same with agent. There's a few massive agent who has all the contact. They know the producer. They know the casting director. And if you're with them, indeed, they can get you in a room. Now, if they don't get you in a room within a certain lapse of time, they realize, okay, this guy is not clicking. Are you going to end up in a bottom shelf? Now, I don't know if it's better to be in a bottom shelf or a big agent or yeah. the top shelf of a small agent. Because a small agent, they find it very hard to get you in a room. If yeah. I looked at the TV here on the BBC, I see the same 20 actors. Yeah. So that means they always work with the same agent and the same agency. Yeah. You know? So it's very hard. So what am I going to do? So I need to do it myself. That's why I started with short. I'm still doing short films now. I'm going to do one in Paris when I'm finishing this, this American movie. Um, so I'm, go, I'm still hoping because that director of that short movie was already done some commercial for Prada and Versace. Maybe in a few years, it might be the new Tom Ford. He might remember as me. Or maybe not. I don't know. But you need to open up, you know, your things. Like do, you do, do you do commercials? I, I, I've never shot. I shot one commercial many, many years ago. Uh, but I'm not a commercial guy. I mean, my agent sent me to them, but I don't have the profile for commercial. Uh, and I think they send me to the wrong things, uh, usually the Buffy guy. And I arrive there, and I'm surrounded by 20-something fucking fitness model who are all on steroid and go six-pack all the way to infinity. I'm like, the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> and one of the things about the dad and stuff like that, I suppose I don't look like what a regular dad would look like in a BMW you know, commercial. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I'm kind of an awkward thing. So... Even for, for, for movies, I've kind of got an awkward look and I've got an accent. So most of my job, I always play a Russian guy. That's why I've got a Russian on point because for them, I don't look French. I look East European. And you got to go yeah. with what the thing, you know, you're going to buy them. So I like to play a variety of different roles. But as I said, it takes a long time. I've been doing this for 10 years now. And only the past two years, I started getting better jobs. Like last year was... I think I've done some of my best work. I'm on an um, Apple TV show called Liaison with Vincent Cassel and Evergreen. I'm on an HBO TV show with uh, Alicia Vincanders. When you're on these TV shows, is it more than one episode? Is it like, are you actually yeah, on the series? Yeah, yeah, you are. Okay, very on, cool. On, on the Apple TV one, I'm only one episode. I think I'm in the first one. And I play a Russian mercenary. But I've got a good back and forth with Vincent Cassel, which is like yeah. a good team. Yeah, cool. yeah. Because uh, Vincent Cassel is fucking really deep. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, on uh, Irma Vet, I'm on two episodes. I play an actor in it alongside uh, Alicia Vikanders. And I do have this monologue with Alicia Vikanders, which Sam again, great scene, very happy about it. Um, and then in smaller movie, like when I did One Shot, I play the main bad guy. Or oh, right now, I'm about to start one called One Ranger. So we're shooting in the UK, in London, and I'll be shooting in LA uh, at some point. Uh, so, um, and in this one, I play a bigger role. So in a smaller budget, I play a bigger role yeah. in a bigger budget. I still play, but the good thing about those shows is sometimes I don't have to fight. I don't play the tough guy. In yeah. here, my play, which is HBO, I play an actor, which yeah. I'm very happy with that. So I'm thinking, hopefully that might happen new opportunities. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm going to ask you one last question. If something were to happen to you today, how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones? I keep hearing people talking about legacy. It's funny because sometimes there's a word that comes along the way and everybody grab onto it and they keep using it. I remember the first time George St. Pierre ever said, I'd like to text my, thank my fan. And after that, every father thought they had some fans. They all say the same thing. I'd like to thank my fans. Dude, there's nobody who got poster of you in the bedroom. Chill. And now I hear every father saying, oh, my legacy is like, dude, nobody gives a fuck about your legacy. Thing about boxing, people always talk about either Mac Tyson or Muhammad Ali. Why? Because the career went further than the boxing ability. They represented yeah. something in the time. And yeah. that's the reason why we remember them. Nobody yeah. gives a fuck about a legacy of a fighter. You come, you fight, you go, you forgotten. That's yeah. it. So I have no, uh, I don't inspire. And I'm never going to have any legacy. Nobody ever going to remember Jesse and I. When I'm dead, I'm dead. I don't have any children. I'm not even giving something to anybody else. So when I'm dead, I will not be remembered. And I'm perfectly fine with it. Because all I want to do is to live my life to the fullest right now. I don't want to focus on when I'm going to be old. I'm already old enough now. I'm close to 50. Before you know it, 
My willy is not going to work as well anymore. My back is <laughs> going to be more painful. So I need to enjoy my life right now. And when I'm dead, I let it go. I'm dead. So to answer your question, how am I going to be remembered? I don't give a fuck. I'm going to use that as our highlighter for this whole podcast. I love it. I love it. I love it. And, you, and it's something I always say too. I mean, a lot of people when, in life, they're so focused on the past. They're so focused on the negativity or something that's happening and, and, and that just drives them. Or they're so focused on the future. And a lot of times we just got to look down at our feet and be where we are right now, be present. And I think well, that's, so that's such a gift. If you can learn how to be present, it's such a gift. Or so focus on what everybody else think of them. Yeah, 100%. You know, because I think that I think that a lot of that's media driven too, right? I mean, you're you're people living in a society where how many likes or how many views they get conducts how their mood is that day, which is so fucking sad. Let me tell you something briefly about that. Yeah. Because of my background, because I never felt like I was loved by my father, I never really had a family thing. I suppose part of me fighting was thinking that maybe all those people watch me fight, they might love me and they might just make me happy. All those eyeballs on me and being put on a pedestrian might just make me more happy. It, it never did. It never yeah. did. I went in cover a magazine. I fought in major arena. I lived all those things. And at the end of the day, you're always by yourself. None of this fame, as little as it was, I'm not pretending to have been extremely famous, but whatever fame that I ever had never really made me happy. It does the reason why now when I do a movie, I don't think about what's going to happen, how the film's going to be shot, edited, cut, uh, distributed. I've got no control on that, so I don't know what people are going to see. So I need to enjoy the moment right now, what I'm doing at this moment. Uh, so I think for me, fighting, I did some good things, but I've learned a lot. That give me so much more life lesson than now in my new career as an actor, I can appreciate it even more. Even so, it's more political than um, fighting was. I'm enjoying it even more for what it is and what I can control. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is awesome. I, I do have one last question I, I wanted to ask you. Where'd you get the nickname Joker from? Uh, Stephen Quadro gave it to me. Uh, Stephen Quadro is for the youngster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, I know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, MMA commentator. Um, first of all, I think he was being king of the cage, and he did pride, and yeah, yeah. He did those. And he used to do cage rage. Yeah. And um, when uh, behind the scene, one time I was doing an interview, he looked at me and said, "You make me think of the Joker because you always got this light-hearted attitude." And but sometimes you can switch. Yeah. You know, I can see in your eyes, and it does happen. I just got out of prime on a movie set there. Uh, and I think I said, when a director said to me, is there a problem? I said, no, 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 there's no problem. But I suppose my eyes was just telling another story because I was sent to my trailer for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why Stephen Quetro man. And basically he called me a joker and since then he stayed. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is awesome, buddy. Where could the audience uh, get a hold of you, follow you, all that stuff? Um, I'm not on Twitter because I'd like to keep an healthy life. <laughs> uh, they can just find me on Instagram at uh, my name, just you know. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much, brothers. This has been awesome. Thanks very much. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Jess, for taking time. It was an incredibly busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nozine podcast. Great, great conversation today. Tons of value, tons of fun. If you guys enjoy this as much as I have, like all weeks, tell your friends, tell your family, spread the word. We're trying to build something special here. Help us by leaving us a review. Five stars would be absolutely amazing. We love spending time with my team reading reviews. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward.